Hey guys, it is August 24th and today is the day that Washington burned. There's the vice president's house. The vice president's in Vietnam today or Singapore this morning. I guess they're going to Vietnam later on today. So things are pretty chill here. So just down from the vice president's house is the British embassy. The villains in today's story, if you will, if there has to be a villain. The British, 207 years ago, marched into Washington, D.C., having defeated a hastily called militia at the Battle of Bladensburg, which is just outside of Washington. The government of Washington ran away, leaving the public buildings of Washington lightly defended. The British marched in, and they decided to sack the city. They only wanted to destroy public buildings, though. They were not going to destroy any private property. So the British settled it, the Capitol building, the White House, and most other government buildings that they could find, with the exception of the patent office. Um, it's believed that the patent master, or whatever his name was, spoke to the British and explained that there was just such a tremendous amount of information and science inside the patent office that to burn it would actually basically be a crime. Uh, the British agreed to spare the patent office and they let it stand. They also let stand the Marine Barracks and the Commandant's House down at 8th and I next to the U.S. Navy Yard. Oh, you be. I us start calling it by its new name, E-E-O-B. They already started washing these streets. Let's go take a look. I was told they were going to like acid wash these streets to give them sort of a brownish color. I'm not really sure if that's what they're doing right now. Kind of spraying something on that street. Perhaps it's something that's going to change the color. We'll see in a few days. These are high pressure hoses and whatnot over here. Let's go over this way. Couple motorcycle cops, couple bicycle cops, couple TV crews filming here. All sorts of television cameras and gadgets. And a boom mic. Maybe they're making a movie. Or a documentary. Something about women's rights, I think they said. It's another one of these cameras. Just because you shot, like, you made sure that. We got a TV crew back up here too. Everybody seems to be filming. As the British moved on Washington, Dolly Madison took charge of the White House personal effects and artwork, enlisting the staff and even some of the slaves that were working at the time to gather up everything they could carry and get it out of the White House. Famous paintings, White House china, the silverware was stuffed in pockets, and they went a fleeing from the White House before the British arrived to burn down the place. Now it's said that the president actually anticipated being taken captive, so he arranged for a sumptuous feast that night, feast enough to feed 40 people. But he ran out and the British came in and found the food and they dined on his meal before they decided to torch the White House. Now, it's a bit of an urban legend that people say the reason it's called the White House is because the paint was applied to hide the British burn marks. But there's actually recorded history of it being called the White House even before the War of 1812. Now, in the Bush administration, Bush Sr., it was the 200th anniversary of the executive mansion, and they stripped off about 30 layers of paint. And when they did that, they actually found scorch marks in the White House on some of the windowsills. Uh, there were actually burn marks still there that have now been painted over. I'm told, however, one burn mark is still visible and that's on the Truman balcony just outside the president's residence. All right. 
So I tell you what, we're going to spin past the White House now. There's more people talking in the cameras. That's a DC statehood video being filmed. This is uh, some sort of union thing. All right, let's head down over to the Capitol, which was also burned. Actually, you know what? Let's go to the South Lawn and take a look over there. So here on the left, you can see on this uh, Madison place, the uh, street is kind of this like beige sand color, yeah? And then over on the right, it's just asphalt. I'm told that when they're done, all the streets will look like that, that beige color. So this black slab of asphalt will be ash and washed and it will look the same as the Madison Place and maybe Jackson Place, which is being worked on right now. All right, lots of fences up today. I think we have a uh, state visit tomorrow. There, Thursday, there's a Prime Minister of Israel is showing up. Now, the Israelis only stay at the Willard Hotel, which is just down the street. So let's go take a look over there, because I'm sure if the Israeli Prime Minister is coming, there's a massive security presence being arranged. Oh, that guy just ran a red light in front of a cop car. And looks like they got screening vehicles set up. A screening tent being built. Screen arriving vehicles. Let's go around the other side. Last year, last time there was a uh, high-level Israeli official, they brought out the snow plows. The snow plows are used as like anti-car bomb vehicles. So let's go see if they've got the snow plows in position yet. Maybe that's tomorrow. Wow, this road's getting repaved quite quickly. They just stripped it the other day, and now they're uh, well on the way to get it filled up. Yep, there are the snow plows. see all the white rental vans that'll be part of the Israeli Prime Minister's motorcade press van press van staff van press 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 wow this is like really blocked off I can't even get around and here are all the snow plows snow plows make really good traffic barriers restricted by special operations division permit US Secret Service yeah so they took away 28 parking spaces, the Secret Service, there's the phone number, you can call them and ask them why. But no parking for a few days. And you can see the snow plows. Let's make our way up this road after the, after the light changes. And there you can see an entire block of nothing but snow plows lined up blade bucket from one end of the block to the other. This is designed to keep any potential car bombs, well, at least one lane of traffic away, and to put something really, really big in between a car bomber and the hotel where the Israeli Prime Minister is going to stay. And then that street's all closed as well. Quite a security operation for a visiting head of state. Now, the War of 1812 is not one of the more discussed wars in American history classes. It's sometimes referred to as the Second American Revolution, but as it was kind of a draw, kind of a punt, uh, it's just not one of those battles that's talked about a lot. Now, in this part of Washington, of the United States, Maryland, the Chesapeake Bay, uh, well, the War of 1812 does have a little bit more special meaning because there were quite a few battles. And right over here, part of the Star Spangled Banner Historic Trail, you can see stories of the Battle of Bladensburg, the, battle, the burning of the White House. As I mentioned, there are still scorch marks you can see on the White House. And this is the general area of the trail that takes you around Washington, D.C., showing you pretty much what I just showed you. Over here, yeah, you can see the British came up the Chesapeake and they had a little battle down here at Point Lookout. And whereas over here, you know, they had a little battle here at the Potomac, mouth of Potomac. And then there was the Battle of St. Leonard's Creek. And then the British troops disembarked, made their way up to Bladensburg, where they defeated the Americans and went in. 
the Chesapeake flotilla went up to about Upper Marlboro, up here on the Patuxent, and that's where they scuttled their ships. And then they made their way up to Baltimore. And Baltimore is where the British were stopped. After DC, they went back up to Baltimore to try to invade Baltimore. But at Fort McHenry, you had Francis Scott Key penning the national anthem. And at North Point, you had the battle that uh, basically decapitated the British forces by killing their general uh, on the first day of fighting. Yep. Here's more. This is actually, I believe, is the Battle of St. Leonard's Creek, which was down on the Patuxent River, just about 30, 40 miles from uh, D.C. So we're down on the ellipse, making our way on the south lawn. The construction is still well underway over here. We thought we had a break as the, uh, the hoarding that was around the fences had come down. But then they just came back out last week and added a bunch of new fences and a bunch of new barriers so we can't see anything. I believe now they're working on the fountain. And some other construction over here on the right. Not much change since we were here the other day. Still the same barriers in the same places. So you can see those excavators. And the excavators are still up there in the southeast quadrant of the White House lawn. I'm not really sure what they're digging up over there, but they're making quite a mess. You can look at my other videos if you want to see more about the construction. I've covered that pretty heavily in other videos. Somebody coming from a briefing at the White House. People looking for different options, perhaps. Now there's one other building I wanted to point it out about the War of 1812 in Washington, D.C., and that's the White House. Well, not exactly the White House, but this house, which served as the White House after the White House was burned. This is known as Octagon House, and this was the executive residence after the White House was burned and while it was being renovated. Octagon House is just a block away from the White House, and it is here where uh, James Madison accepted the treaty that ended the War of 1812, the Treaty of Ghent. You can see here the signing ceremony, Christmas Eve 1814, and it was signed on this table, which I believe is still inside the Octagon House. Anyway. All right, so we're on Pennsylvania Avenue making our way down to the Capitol. The Capitol today looks nothing like it did back in 1814. Let's go take a look a little bit closer and I can show you where the fire was actually lit at the U.S. Capitol 207 years ago today. I don't think the cops are writing a ticket though. They've got a problem at the FBI actually. He's being called by FBI police. They're directing him uh, into, looks like to the parking garage. Must have a need for an ambulance at the FBI today. And down he goes into the FBI parking garage. Medic one. Hmm. I'll tell you what, we'll go try to see what time is it. It's 2.21. Uh, we'll go see if we can find the uh, medical call and see what that was. Yeah, was one responding for abdominal pain, female patient, at 9.35, Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, cross of 9th Street. Over here on my right is the archives. When the British came into Washington, a clerk from the State Department uh, managed to grab the Declaration of Independence and spirit it out of Washington so that the British wouldn't be able to destroy that historic document. So some uh, low-level clerk at the State Department is considered to be the hero of saving the Declaration of Independence from the British torches. Now, over here at 600 Pennsylvania Avenue is the Federal Trade Commission. And I don't really care about the FTC at the moment. I care more about this little plaque. There it is. From 1800 to 1865, this was the headquarters of the National Intelligencer, a newspaper published by Samuel Harrison Smith and later by Joseph Gales and William Winston Seaton. 
ran for 65 years and was the leading newspaper in Washington, D.C. Now, the reason I point this out is because the British did not like the National Intelligence Service. The British commander, uh, Cockburn, he specifically set out to burn this building to the ground, burn all the printing presses, burn all the stores of paper, because they had been writing some nasty things about him. However, local citizens persuaded him not to burn the building because the fire would spread and destroy their civilian properties. So instead, they dismantled the building as much as they can, brick by brick. They smashed as many newspaper printing presses as they could, brick by brick, with a brick. And then they took away every copy of the letter C from his printer's block so that he could not publish anything about him because he no longer had the letter C. Tricky way to do it. All right, we're back at the U.S. Capitol. And I believe they're actually in session today, or maybe it's just pro forma session, which is where they're technically... Yeah, the Senate's not in session right now. They've already adjourned, probably. Sometimes they go in session simply for the purposes of moving the paperwork. <laughs> They're not actually voting and stuff. They just need to move the paperwork. Now, the Senate's out today. The House was supposed to be in at like 1 o'clock today. And there are quite a few vehicles out here, so they might actually be here. Boy, it's hot. I feel sorry for them. The suits. budget. Uh, so these look like House Republicans. Yeah, Republican Study Committee RS. These are really conservative Republicans. And uh, they're all taking pot shots at the President's budget. Alright, so this is the Capitol that you guys all know. But at one time it looked nothing at all like this. At one time it was just one small little segment of this from about there to there. That was the U.S. Capitol building, just a square block. That is where the uh, current rot rotunda is, not the rotunda, but the uh, statue square, the sketch, God, I'm so out of it. Statuary Hall is located. That's the old House of Representatives. The Supreme Court was there. The Library of Congress was down in the basement. The British came to this one small section and they lit it aflame. But luckily, or unluckily, the basement was filled with all the clerk's documents, and that paper just ignited massively, so massively that the British were forced to flee the building before they could properly light the other parts of the Capitol on fire. So a lot of the building was actually spared. Now the roof was made out of this beautiful glass, which basically melted into like liquid hot magma. <laughs> the glass melted and dripped down into the hall. The building was all burned on the inside, but the outside, it all survived, and it was actually rebuilt as part of the new capital. After the British left and the rebuilding was started, they built this section, and then the Senate, the old Senate, and then a small dome and a small rotunda in the middle. It wasn't until around the, just before the Civil War that they expanded to the new house and the new Senate, and then during the Civil War and beyond is when they built the new dome. And they built an extension on the west front and then an extension here on the east front. And I showed you the columns that used to be here on the east front oh many videos ago. A lot of the work, a lot of the stone from the east front reconstruction is hiding in a park in Washington, D.C. in another one of my videos. During the time that the Capitol was being reconstructed, there was something called the Brick Capitol. And that was built by private funds over there where the Supreme Court is now sitting. So the Capitol building, for about five years, five to seven years, was located over there where the Supreme Court is. Anyway, the British came through, made a big fire, and then they left. One of the interesting things about the British invasion of Washington is how it ended. The British basically controlled the town. There was no organized resistance of any sort. But that night, there was a massive storm. Some even speculate that it was a hurricane. All right, there were reports of a tornado in the city. And at one time, a couple of British cannons were actually blown over, lifted up and blown over. Buildings were torn to shreds, roofs were ripped off, walls were blown down. 
The British basically were like, what the heck was this? It was a storm unlike anything they had ever seen. The British felt that they had accomplished their mission. They were never intending to seize and hold Washington, more just sort of to raid the city and make political, political hay out of the thing. Unfortunately for the British, it kind of backfired. There was a lot of opposition in Europe. The British regarded as heathens for sacking a capital. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't score very well diplomatically for what they had done, despite all their protests. Well, the Americans did it too in York, or the Americans did it along the Erie, Lake Erie. It just didn't play well in Europe. In fact, there were even MPs inside the British Parliament, the opposition, who took issue with the British government's position of sacking Washington, D.C. So we're down in Southeast D.C., passing that little white house right there. That's the birthplace of John Philip Sousa, the Marine Corps band leader and composer who wrote many famous marches, like the Washington Post March. And I think he stars and stripes forever. He lived there, or he was born there, but eventually he lived down here. And this is the Commandant's house. This is the U.S. Marine Barracks at 8th and I, and the Commandant's house is where the Commandant of the Marine Corps resides, the guy in charge, the general in charge of all Marines around the world. This building was spared from the British torches, as was the Marine Barracks. It was said because it was a courtesy extended by the British Marines to the American Marines, sort of a professional courtesy not to build, not to burn down their house. In addition, the Americans had already burned down the Navy Yard, which I'm going to show you in just a second. So it wasn't that much more military value in sparing or burning this building or these buildings. Now, straight ahead of me is the U.S. Navy Yard, and it is actually still a Navy Yard. This is a U.S. Navy property. This is where they built the big guns of the battleships. But back in the 1800s, they actually worked on, well, sailing ships here. There were some dry docks here, and they would actually build ships. Two of the ships that were being constructed or worked on at the time were burned by the Americans so they wouldn't fall into British hands. And, whoa, that's loud. And all the stores of weapons and other munitions were also burned so that the British couldn't take advantage of those materials. The Navy knew the Army was, the British Army was coming, and they tried to deny them the use of anything they possibly could. So now we're actually entering U.S. government property. Uh, you can see the conning tower of an old submarine right over there, along with some deck guns situated on a base. There's a lot of little uh, museum pieces over here. This is actually the home of the U.S. Naval Museum. Oh, it's being uh, rebuilt, I understand. Down here you can see a big propeller. And then over there, one of the World War I railway guns. One of the big, what is that, a 14-inch or 16-inch railway gun, or maybe a 10-inch. This is where they built the gun barrels for the cruisers and battleships back in the early days of this century, or last century. inlet repurposed as a fountain. Perhaps that was one of the old dry docks. Don't even know. So across the street from me is an area known as Fort McNair. This is where the British came to burn American stores of gunpowder and other munitions. And it's where they actually had a major accident. You see they were stuffing the gunpowder down a well when one of the caskets uh, caught fire and well it just blew up and it blew up all the other gunpowder killing about 30 british soldiers uh, that and the combination of the storm well that was enough to just do in the british invasion they were done ready to go home fort mcnair of late is also the alternative landing zone for marine one when the white house landing zone is unavailable which is right now due to construction so we're seeing a lot of marine one and a lot of other helicopter operations surrounding the White House, such as the press helicopters, staff helicopters, the V-22s, they're coming down here to Fort McNair.